Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. My name is Marian Dragunov, and I'll be your host today for this exciting first episode of the art and science of DevOps coaching. We designed this series to provide you, Scrum Masters, Agile coaches and consultants, and practitioners with the insights and knowledge needed to further grow your careers into DevOps coaching. Before we get started, a few house rules. I want to let you know that this event is being recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to revisit the valuable insights shared here today. And additionally, portion of these sessions may be shared on other platforms to extend the reach of this discussion. Um, I have the pleasure here today to have an awesome lineup of speakers who will be sharing um, their exp expertise on kickstarting the DevOps career, lessons learned, pitfalls to avoid, but this event is not just about them, it's also about you, participants, and we want to encourage you to be interactive, to ask us, and then feel free to, to, to bring up your case study to the session, and you can do so by using the comments, right? I, I see some of you already doing that, please give it a try. I encourage you to bring up your personal case um, of a team or project you're involved in, so we can give you recommendations. We would like to have it as a dialogue as much as possible, and of course, as Agile practitioners, we truly believe in the power of feedback. So we would like to ask you to fill out our satisfaction survey at the end of this session. Um, we have a lot to cover today. We kindly request that questions, comments, and responses are kept concise to allow for a broader range of coverage, perspectives, insights. And again, please don't uh, forget the survey at the end of the session. We count on you to continuously improve and to shape future events. Um, before we dive in, please take a moment to ensure your devices are in silent mode, if applicable, and if possible, focus here, listen to us and minimize distractions. This will help us create an engaging environment for everyone involved. And again, welcome to all of you. I'm very thrilled to be here today. And um, feel free to, to interact with us, connect, um, and take away the valuable insights to your day-to-day -day business and to, to your professional journey. And with all that introduction, welcome to our guests. Let's start in alphabetical order. Welcome, Alexei. Hello, hello. Alexei is a senior agile transformation coach based in New York. And uh, you shared with me you like to thrive in solving complex problems and finding the most effective and efficient solutions. Sounds sounds very fancy. Uh, uh, a very uh, a very good man wrote that, I guess. Very clever man. Yeah. So hi. Um, I guess the intro is is what what, what you'd like me to introduce myself, right? So um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Alex Ivanov. I'm I'm located in New York. Um, the title says senior agile coach, even though I, I uh, quite often dare to disagree about the level of seniority in, in agile world because we strive for a flat hierarchy, right? But I guess we reached the peak when, when we need to introduce a little bit more linear uh, roles. So yes, uh, 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 the, the role is senior agile coach. Um, would you like me to go over my background quickly, Marian? Just, just to... let's, let's jump over quickly to our next guest and okay. we'll come back to that. Okay. And uh, next on my list is Anthony, who is Agile Coach and Scrum Master based in Toronto. Hey, everyone. Hello, Anthony. Welcome. Thank you. A um, little bit about me. Uh, I've been in the technology industry for almost 20 years um, with a background in systems administration, uh, cloud engineering, and of course, DevOps engineering. And uh, now I work as an Agile Coach in Toronto. And um, yeah, I'm... Excited to be here today. Thanks for having me, Marion. Thank you. And uh, we also have Darren Flynn, who is Agile Transformation Coach and Consultant Experience in Large Scale Transformation. Welcome, Darren. Thanks very much, Marion. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Darren. I'm, as mentioned, a, a coach based in Munich. I'm not from Munich, I'm from Ireland, um, but been living in, in Munich in Germany now for 12 or 13 years. Um, background as well, quite a technical background. I come from software development and, and uh, did a lot of work around around that starting off my career before transitioning into more sort of uh, scrum mastery, project management, and into coaching around sort of BI and big data uh, and into the consulting world uh, now in a large insurance company. So really happy to be here and happy to share some 
thoughts, tips, advice today. My pleasure, Darren. And um, I would like to, to ask you the first question, which is, uh, could you tell us a bit more on how you became interested in DevOps slash Agile coaching? Sure. Um, well, as, as I mentioned, and I think as all of us, because of the technical background, I mean, I, I studied computer science in, in university and, and did a lot of the projects in university around sort of database uh, technologies and even into stuff around robotics. And in all of the projects I worked in, um, I used to, you know, break down my work into smaller chunks and, you know, try to figure out, well, what's the expectations and what are we learning? How's it going? How do we improve? Um, so a little bit, I was working Agile without actually knowing what Agile was um, around the same time that the, the manifesto was written. Um, and when I started into wow. my working career, I joined a lot of big hierarchical organizations who didn't work agile and got very frustrated with how my you know projects I got involved in were delivering and, and gradually started to look to ways of doing it better and heard about scrum um uh, sort of 10 years ago or so and and decided this could be something that helped and did my training as a scrum master with, with Jeff Sutherland and, and got started tried to apply what I learned again in these big hierarchical traditional slow moving organizations and sort of found what worked what didn't and and found you know with my technical background with the strengths that i had that uh, maybe moving into this type of coaching thing this is where i saw my strengths helping people developing people finding better ways of doing things um and gradually moved in that direction and got an opportunity to, to start off um as a scrum master and agile coach and have, haven't looked back since all right great Sounds exciting. What about, you, what about you, Anthony? What was your trigger to uh, to get into this uh, career path? Oh, man. So I, I've had an interesting career path, uh, to say the least. Um, I started off as a fashion designer and was mainly focused on people. Ironically, uh, in the fashion business, everything is very fast moving, very fast paced. So it's, it's natural to uh, collaborate and communicate as much as possible. And so when I got into the tech industry, um, due to the implosion of the clothing industry within Canada, uh, I realized not only can I make money, but I can create some change. So I started to work as a, as a Unix admin. Uh, that's how I got in and eventually moved up to uh, systems admin for Windows, VMware, and eventually into cloud engineering, where I started to see the power of cloud. And eventually I got into DevOps and it, it, really, it really fascinated me for the fact that we can move fast. We started to break down silos and we started communicating and collaborating together. And that to me was bringing back that element that I learned in fashion about people. And so, the more I dug into DevOps, I started to, to understand that it really is about people. So when I started to do more cloud training uh, for the past five years, um, I, I started to dig in, into it even more. And that's where the passion came from to become a scrum master and agile coach. It, it just, it was a great fit. And I found that without agility itself uh, devops cannot survive so the two couple together really nicely and ever since then i've been uh i've been loving this this new journey uh, as a coach and you know bringing devops to the masses thank you anthony i think that it sounds like the title of a book from fashion industry to devops culture <laughs> Let me know if you have a publication on that. I'll, I'll be excited <laughs> to read it. Um, and and you, you touched an inter interesting point. Let, let's let's focus, guys, for a second. What, what what do you see as the main differences between agile and DevOps? What what is what is agile and DevOps for you? Who would like to to uh, to start this discussion? Maybe a couple of comments on that from my side. I mean, I don't. Personally, I see a very, very close connection between Agile and DevOps. Um, when it boils down to both of them, it's about mindset, it's about values, it's about 
culture um and i think there's uh, a lot of people sort of see well you know agile and people talk about agile they mean scrum so the actual way where you're implementing it or and devops they talk about well it's the pipeline that we're we're implementing or it's the automation or something like that but for me it's 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 the mindset behind it it's you know it's this idea of bringing closer collaboration either with the customer with other teams getting that feedback working together looking at how do we want to improve how do we experiment how do we do things um and, and just talking together so i think they're really really close together and then when you dig further into it then there's maybe where some of the differences come but in i think at its core they're very very similar and i think as anthony mentioned i think one doesn't work to the full benefit without the other indeed indeed all yeah, right true anthony you wanted to mention something yeah i i wanted to to echo the the comments i mean one one without the other just doesn't work and um i find that the the core of devops is truly communication and collaboration because we can we can install all the tech in the world. I mean, the, the technical is the easy part, but the communication and collaboration, this is the this is the part that we I find that we suffer as an industry. We don't communicate enough. We don't collaborate enough. You know, there's you see a lot of organizations with DevOps teams and then infrastructure teams and then the developer teams. Well, why don't we just all work together as one big team? How about that? You know? So I find that when we start to break down those silos and start organizing as a big team with a shared common goal, things seem to just run smooth. And that's to me, the heart of DevOps. Yeah. I think uh, another, uh, another aspect of the whole um, DevOps, DevOps versus agile um, there's still quite a lot of cultural, uh, and by cultural, I don't mean um, intercultural uh, differences. It's more cultural coming from um, organizational point of view. So for instance, if we have, um, I don't know, um, applications and infrastructure and security and other areas, there's still quite a lot of cultural aspects that come with that. Who is responsible for what, where, um, how teams interact, uh, make it my job versus I don't want to have it as my job, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when we talk about agile and breaking the silos and agility, that concept always would apply to DevOps. So successful DevOps implementation will never be able to uh, foster without applying majority of um, uh, agile uh, softer skills. So being able to talk, being, being able to uh, become cross-functional, uh, taking over the responsibility for areas that weren't historically yours. So basically opening up, being open for the new challenges, for new, uh, you know, learning curves, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I mean, when we say that it comes hand in hand, DevOps and, and Agile, it just sounds really fancy. But in, in reality, can DevOps exist without Agile? Probably can, because DevOps is, in a nutshell, is something that goes around a lot of technical aspects, but be it successful without applying like a thick layer of agility on top of it, I think it 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 it, it would struggle uh, to say the least because it would face the same challenges like it did before. We're not really reinventing the wheel all that much. We're not creating something that's super groundbreaking. Uh, it's just establishing uh, more. Uh, I'd call it seamless connections between between the areas that were predominantly siloed before. That's what we really do. Thank you, Alexei, and uh, I, I fully agree with you guys. Um, that's that's uh, a, a crucial. Um, these are the crucial aspects for me as well in in agile and, and, and DevOps. And for me, DevOps is agile. And Alexei, you touched upon a. Um, the important aspect, which is also asked by, by one of our participants, what were for you the key skills you needed to develop to become a skilled DevOps coach? And also to what extent you needed um, strong technical skills um, for this coaching role, having in mind that DevOps is or could be very tech driven? Um, yeah, so uh, 
it's a it's a it's a difficult uh, question for me to answer because my background is is very much uh, very heavily is in IT and in in uh, technical arena. As as a matter of fact, I became a DevOps engineer before I became a Scrum master or uh, or an Agile coach for that matter. Um, but if I look back right now in hindsight, um, I don't really think that a lot of things that the DevOps coach would do would go very, very away from from the Agile coach, um, uh, purely because of what I mentioned before. You don't need to have a vast technical knowledge of the processes in order to implement uh, silo breaking and make people talk to each other, solve the problems that are on, on the level of uh, miscommunication, uh, ownership of the items, following up with the uh, with the actions that they get, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Darren would probably pick up a little bit more on that because he has a slightly different path to me. Um, so he came in <laughs> not as a technical person. So Darren, I'll, I'll toss the ball over to your yard. Yeah, I'm, I mean, when you're looking at sort of what technical skills are needed, I think it always helps if you're in a DevOps world to be able to have discussions with the team members and, and you know, on the same eye level that you understand the terminology. I think and one of the things that, that some of us have discussed before is this aspect of a DevOps unicorn. A guy who comes in and has every skill in the book can come in and coach. He can facilitate the teams. He can implement the pipeline. He can do the automation. For me, that doesn't exist. My role as a DevOps coach is to enable the team to be able to do that. So we will have all of these technical skills in these teams. I need to be able to understand what needs to be done and then work with the guys and the girls in the teams to actually get it done, to implement it, to look at how do we improve? How do we start to look at this, inspect and adapt in terms of you know a continuous delivery? How do we experiment? How do we do stuff around automation? I don't need to be the expert on it, but I need to understand what I'm talking about when I'm actually helping people to, to open up to be able to do that. Right. So more the, the role of enablers, right? I, I love the DevOps unicorn. Uh, that's a unique and, and privileged position that's seeked in a lot of uh, companies. Um, Anthony, I'm, I'm thinking about our, our participants coming from a more technical background. And I wanted to ask, do you have any, any tips for someone looking to make the transition from where you've been, right? Um, keyword cloud for example, um, to the DevOps coaching role. Also having in mind, if you don't mind, um, to mention that we've actually met to, through our uh, DevOps coaching training. So uh, yes. it's uh, the passion for coaching that, that met us. Yeah, so interestingly enough, uh, when I was doing technical training uh, for cloud, I, I got to see coaching in the wild, if you will. And it was so fascinating to me. It, 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 it touched my heart. I was like, this is what I want to do. And so I, I went out and I, I took a, a full-blown coaching course uh, that was, you know, ICF certified. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is the International Coaching Federation. And so they have very, very high standards. And although I didn't get into actual coaching, uh, in my daily job until later, I did realize that when I became a scrum master, that coaching came into play so much, so many times, uh, so many different scenarios that came up where if I didn't have that coaching background, I didn't, I, I really wouldn't understand where to go. And so as I grew within that role and, you know, slowly became an agile coach, I started to understand how coaching applies into this role. So it is, you know, as was said before, it's not necessarily about having the coaching skills on its own because you can ask all the open-ended questions you'd like. It's not going to help at times where the practitioners really need it. And so having that DevOps background, that DevOps understanding, the technical, is very crucial because now in order to best guide the team, 
you can ask the right questions, the questions that will enable the team members to, to really understand what it is that they have to do. But if you don't have, if you, if you can't marry the technical with that coaching uh, skill set, then it can be tough. And we see a lot of this in the industry where agile coaches come in, they don't have that technical background and they say that they're DevOps coaches, but they can't really support the people that are doing the technical work. And so uh, I, I truly think that one without the other, it's, it, it just doesn't work. It, it needs to be there. So having that, that coaching skill set, the, you know, what we call the soft skills is, is necessary. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you, Anthony. Um, you can hear me, right, guys? Let's, yeah. let's pick up a, a question from the audience. Dimitri asks, um, curious to learn what it is uh, within you that needed to change to become a coach. And uh, I'd like to first answer that one. Um, maybe it's unfair to pass all the questions to you. Um, I, I was a service manager, the way we know it from ITIL, and also a project manager before uh, transitioning to an agile coach. And for me, the, the, the toughest thing to change was um, the necessity or the, 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 the way to manage and control every aspect of a service slash project to learn, to give um, freedom, space, time um, to the team, to the key roles, to stakeholders outside of the team to find, to reach their own solutions. Um, and also the, the mental agility, the mental flexibility to, to think um, not in terms of a specific framework, right? So if, if you prescribe every time Scrum, Kanban, and uh, two tools which are uh, used to um, manage planning and, and manage deployment, that, that's not going to work. You're, you're not a good agile coach, right? So you, you, think, you, you should think of what, what help, helps to the people, what, what they need, what their, their real problem is before, um, before jumping into a solution. And last but not least, um, for me, the concept of minimum viable product was, was game changer. Um, nothing has to be perfect. Um, but the first version that is the minimum to move on, to make some progress, to deliver something that's, that's actually crucial. I don't know if you guys have anything to add. What changed for you to become a coach? I see Alexi getting ready to speak. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> you, sir. Thank you. Um, I was I was going to say that for me, before I became a coach, I think, and it, it's linked to also in one of the other questions in 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 the chat around the different hats that a coach has to wear. Before I became a coach, in the roles that I had was well, despite you know being really interested in agile and want to move that way, the expectation on me and therefore how I acted was, I'm going to get this done me i will try and help the team do it but i'm going to be the one who has to drive this through exactly and to change into a coach it was well how do i first of all reflect to take that step back to enable others to do it to really give them the space the skills the guidance the advice on on being able to bring something but also being aware when maybe i have to change that hat and have to act either you know as a consultant to go in and say right i'm just going to get this done or as a mentor, or as a facilitator, or as a coach. So it's not just, uh, as we said, asking these open questions. It's going in and reflecting, okay, what type of role do I have to play now? And that for me was the big learning in, in sort of transitioning into a coach and is understanding those different hats that, that has to be worn. It's not just read a book on coaching and, and now I'm a coach. It's getting experience, it's doing it, it's learning, it's failing, and then trying again. I think that uh, me and Mr. Flynn know each other for way too long because I was about to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, apart from, apart from, I would just elaborate it. And in my head, personally, I think I still overcome this challenge every single time when I come in, because when I come into uh, whatever event I host or uh, if I have to uh, mentor, coach, whatever. Um, 
because my 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 role i think it's it's three different areas that, that that darren was just mentioning so it's it's consulting it's training it's it's coaching and quite often you don't really know which one is kicking in uh you come in and people would have a very specific problem uh that you know the answer to and your consulting hat just screams okay i have a solution for you i'm going to give it to you right now um but uh you're supposed to as a coach not provide answers like that you're supposed to guide people and and help them to learn themselves because that's how we we, we receive information the best so that's a confrontation within yourself sometimes to fight over your own natural instinct of providing the right answer uh, and helping people to get um, there with their own journey, even though you know that they're not maybe on the right path right now. But sometimes letting people to fail and naturally learn that this is the case and getting to the right path quicker uh, helps. Your job here is to make sure that they fail quick, they learn on that, reflect, and get back on the right track. Love it. I, I really like the discussion. We, we touch about technical topics and, and also the different roles of an agile coach, different hats. Um, and, and there is um, one, one point or one aspect of coaching that, that pops up in the questions quite often. Um, and it is about soft skills. For, so uh, move a second from, from the technical skills. We'll come back to, to that later. But um, for example, Anthony, what would you think about the importance of soft skills? Um, we have here a keyword in the chat, vulnerability. Is that a strength, weakness, somewhere in between? What, what is the role of soft skills in, in DevOps coaching and and the students or, or the participants in a team? Oh, my God. I can talk about this topic for hours. Um, <laughs> there's just so much. But for me, uh, I've always found that starting with, um, with a sense of, I guess you would say empathy, meeting people where they're at and really understanding what, what their struggle is, what they're going through and finding that common area of trust. And once we have trust, that's the foundation. That's where it all starts. And this can provide psychological safety within the team, within each team member. And as coaches, we are also leaders. And so we should lead by example. And I found uh, personally that the best way to, to build that foundation of trust is, is through vulnerability. I've, I've, I've done many times, uh, I've gone over things that were personal to me that I've shared with my team members and it allowed that space for other people to share their own quirks, to share their own, uh, challenges. And this developed that strong bond of trust that I experience now with the teams that I work with and, I find that without it, we're just we're just working as um, just as a a group of people, and we don't want to work as a group of people. We want to work as a team. Right. So having that trust is is the absolute foundation, and um, I, I can't stress it enough. So being empathetic, meeting people where they're at, to build that trust and showing that vulnerability to lead the team to do the same is crucial in, in my eyes. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to, to repeat on that as well around the trust. I think it's hugely important. I think to be a successful coach and that's whether you're, you're working with one or two teams as a scrum master or as an agile coach or a DevOps coach with bigger areas or organizations, what you need to do is you need to show that you have got some skin in the game. You're not just coming in to tick something in the box and saying, yeah, okay, I've supported you now go, but to actually show that I'm part of this, I want to help achieve something here. I want, and then the teams will trust you. Then we can work together. Then we can have these discussions while I'm supporting a team. I'm part of that team. Um, and I think to have the, those soft skills, to build up those relationships, to build up that psychological safety, to build up, you know, hey, 
it's okay for us to experiment, to make mistakes, to fail, and that we have the freedom to do that. And I'm not in there and going to judge you or go back and report to a manager because, hey, Alexi messed something up. No, we're here to to enable. We're all part of the same team. And I think that's where the soft skills are really, really important to, to enable that. I, I, I used to hear that a lot, by the way. Alexi messed something up. Uh, we have to come clean it up. So, yeah. Alexei, I have a question for you in that line. Uh, what about resistance? How would you address resistance to change when uh, when coaching teams? Oy, oy, How do you deal uh... with resistance? Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> Oof, Bringing up the tough topics. Controversial, yeah. Um, it depends. So uh, it depends on different levels. Uh, I guess the answer that I have for uh, which is like more universal answer, really. Uh, it applies to many different levels. Um, and when I when I say levels, so we, we talk about team resistance, we talk about uh, mean management resistance, we talk about uh, more C-level, senior-level uh, uh, resistance, and so on. Um, so all the way to the board uh, kind of level of organization. And depends, of course, on the uh, scale of your organization. Uh, uh, again, uh, I can speak for myself and Darren and Marin yourself. Back in the day, uh, you know that levels where we worked is, is very, very large scale um, organization. So, uh, you know, the, the levels of resistance are different and for different reasons. And it's important to understand why there's a resistance. And if you can flip um, uh, the individual uh, in, their, in their position. What I mean by that is um, if an individual is resistant to a change, say we're rolling out a large uh, agile DevOps, doesn't matter, uh, digitalization um, uh, transformation and um, we have a uh, senior or mid management that is resistant. Uh, important to understand why. Are they just afraid of a change because they're losing power because you have to empower teams? Are they um, scared because they're going to lose a job? Do they just not want to do anything and they're comfortable where they are? And if you can win them over, if you can actually convince them that this can work, uh, find winners, find those that are willing to work with you and try to prove to others that to others that that this thing can happen. Kind of goes similar on the team level. Um, you need to find champions and convince people. I just find that, that it works a lot easier with the teams usually uh, um, to convince them because you can you can demonstrate that the work that they can do can be done a lot quicker, more efficiently, and uh, painless in a longer term if we apply the concepts correctly. If we actually implement what we preaching for and 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 live by that, and we are the ones who should set the example. So, I see quite often that coaches would come in and talk a lot, but then don't actually what we call eat your own dog food, right? When you are mm, not following the principles that that uh, that you preach for. Yeah, I, I, again, right. I can talk. I can talk forever, right. but I'll probably let somebody else to pick up. Um, yeah, I feel identified with what you've just said. Uh, you know, some some bad people see us unrightfully as team entertainers and, and team babysitters, right? Um, and, and I can assure you that's not, not the objective of a DevOps slash Agile coach. Um, so for those people who are a bit more skeptical, um, how do you think, guys, a coach would ensure that uh, the efforts are aligned with business objectives and goals, that we actually link what we do with value for the business slash value for for the customer. Anthony, would you like to give it a try? I don't need to try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For, for me, it's it's when people understand what it is that they have to do or that they are a part of, then I don't see a lot of resistance. The resistance usually comes from, you know, why are we doing this? This is stupid, or we've never done things this way. And this requires a lot, uh, a lot of patience and a lot of education. So actually sitting down with the person and say, hey, listen, this is why we're doing this. And this is why we have to align with the business. And when team members and teams actually understand that, I found that, you get a lot more traction, um, and it's it's just a matter of again, it goes back to communication. When you have that open communication, when you have this 
transparency. Uh, it's no longer the executives hiding behind the shadows of, you know, what really has to happen. It's no, everyone's, everyone's got skin in the game. You know, uh, Alexi was talking about that earlier. And I truly believe that, you know, as DevOps coaches and agile coaches, we need to have skin in the game too. And that means that we need to support our teams. We need to support the team members in whatever way possible. And if that means that we have to sit and, and explain to everyone, even if it takes a whole day, it doesn't matter. Because once everyone's on the same page, we're all on the same level, we have the same understanding of business initiatives versus you know, the work that needs to be done, then it's smooth sailing after that. But without that actual understanding, uh, there is no alignment. I think the, 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 the topic of everyone understanding the why is really important. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to make this change? Why do we want to move in this direction? You're always going to have people or different roles or levels within the organization who are against it. And I think it's not a case of coming in and hitting them over the head and saying, here's the scrum guide, just go do that. <laughs> but working with them and saying, okay, how do we move in the right direction? And read the manual, you know, right, Darren? Just read, just follow this ten-step guide, and then we're we're all agile. It's easy. That's <laughs> how coaching works. But it's for me, it's about well, if you are resistant to this, how can I, as a coach, help you? If on a scale of one to ten, where do you find yourself on in happiness of this transition? If you're saying you're a two or a three, well, then how can I support you, or what will it take to move you to a four or a five or a six out of ten? Not to say you need to be a full supporter of this straight away because that's just not realistic, but taking small steps and really guiding and helping people to see, ah, there might be a better way to do this. And we're going to co-create to find that it's not going to be maybe agile or DevOps by the book, but we'll find something that works. And only if we work together, can we do that? And you have to understand the why you have to understand where you're going as an organization, as a business and what a team or an area is working at to deliver towards that. And only when all of that links together, can you actually move any of these transformations successfully? I also Indeed. wanted to add Thank something um, that it's never, it's never uh, rainbows and unicorns. It's not always this no. easy. There will be people that refuse to change. And that's just, you know, the nature of human beings. Um, and what we can do with those, with those people is all we can do is to go through, you know, what we were saying before, the why, the, and, and give them an understanding. And if then they don't, they don't have that understanding, well, then they're lost in the, in the process. They're lost in, in that transition. And there's nothing that we can do about it as coaches because you can only do what you, what you can do. And acceptance is, is part of that transition. Yeah, and I think important thing to sum it up, Agile is not a silver bullet. It's not going to cure every single <laughs> thing, uh, convince every single person. And for sure, Agile is not for everyone. Um, Agile is not for every organization, for every project. And you cannot improve things just by calling it, uh, just by calling people Scrum Masters and Product Owners, um, empowering empowering managers and things like that. So yeah, it, it's just uh, uh, important to remember that it sometimes fails as well. Mm -hmm. We we have that. Yeah, fail fast, right? Learn, move on. Yeah. A big learning for me, guys, in, in these lines was um, to offer support, guidance, and solutions without actually um, insisting on the tool or um, or a framework that you have uh, back in mind. Uh, very often, the, the team doesn't care if it's uh, Scrum, Kanban, coming from Safe, uh, coming from a um, another guide slash book um, slash podcast you've heard about. Uh, what they care is to be helped and, and move on and, and get their problem resolved. So sometimes it helps uh, actually not to mention that uh, you're doing a certain uh, workshop um, in terms of a standard practice, but actually say, um, hey, this is going to help you exactly in this objective with these results. Right. 
Um, we have one question that I, I particularly liked. Um, how much is the scope of an angel coach? Are you supposed to supervise and manage just one project? Couldn't we have more than one at the same time? Um, it, it really depends. Um, the, the first part of the question is, ideally, I wouldn't like to supervise any more projects slash teams, right? Um, it's not part of the agile coaching role, as I understand it. Um, of course, there are organizations that you still need to make sure it's going to happen, whatever it takes, right? Um, let's call it entrepreneurial mindset rather than supervisor. Um, and then it depends, of course, on the complexity of the project. It could be one project with uh, four teams, and then that's uh, already full time. Um, or uh, you can have um, two, three, four teams uh, which have smaller projects um, slash products. And um, you, you consult, mentor, train, and coach them together. Um, and I would like to go back to a bit more on the individual level, right? So coming back to the title of kicking off your DevOps career, um, how to become a coach, lessons learned. Um, and I have a particularly interesting question here in my mind. Um, and I need a volunteer, a voluntary. Who would like to share a messed up story about a particularly challenging coaching situation? Something that went wrong, right? In the lines of Alexei, what you said fell fast. I can see that. Sometimes we fail. <laughs> <laughs> we will all have them, by the way, right? Well, oh, totally. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, Darren. It's, it, I think it would be quicker if we talk better. about our successes. I mean, shorter uh, list. I think uh, going through going through the 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 list of of failures. I mean, I think that's a little bit what we referred to earlier about you're going to have failures as you learn, and and even when you think you're successful, that's probably the time where it's actually going to kick kick back and and you'll have a failure. I mean, I've had experiences with really in in these big organizations working with really big infrastructure strategic products that are being you know rolled out every six months and we want to translate that into an agile and a devops setup and the teams and the, the leadership are some are saying let's go others are saying no we don't want to do this and i think it's for me where where we've had success there is really working directly with the teams um getting them started figuring out experimenting and and and, and seeing where we go but i i have had you know uh, uh difficult discussions with 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 especially leadership of these areas who feel hey i'm losing power um and you know i'm suddenly it's the team who are responsible for this and i'm not doing it i'm going to push back and i've had a, a good experiences and bad experiences there with how you react to that. I think this when we talk about resistance to change, sometimes it is, well, okay, how do I support you? And other times is, well, you're not resisting, you're actually standing in the way here purposely and having to have that open open discussion. And for me, that was, on the one hand, it was a failure because we didn't manage to change this guy. He didn't change his, his behavior. He didn't change his mindset, but we had to change around him and the organization changed around him. He, he wasn't around anymore because they realized this just didn't fit. So even when you think you're being successful, there's going to be someone comes back and kicks and you need to find a way around. So, and I think there's so many examples of that. You're always going to see, see this and have that challenge. And that's precisely what I was referring to earlier as it's not for everyone. Um, I mean, the world is very large and uh, not every organization is agile, not every part of organization even agile. Um, if you don't want to be a part of this journey, there's, quite a few things that you can do i mean it's a, it sounds very harsh i know but uh, at the same time we're not on a crusade over here to convince that every every single project and 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 person have to be baptized into the world of agility hey right. yeah we can also be wrong i mean exactly. Agile Crusaders, I, I think yeah. that's also the title of a book right yeah. <laughs> yeah we can go in and say hey let's go agile and everyone says well actually you know it doesn't actually fit here I had that. My my actually my very first um, attempt to bring uh, anything agile into an organization was the attempt to bring in Scrum into um, uh, a large asset management uh, company in in Germany. Um, convinced of it, this will work. We'll be able to build up these 
great solutions there and, and deliver more quality uh, data for all the reporting by taking an agile and a scrum approach. Totally failed. We didn't get the buy-in mm. from leadership. We didn't get the buy-in from the people. It was just this small team trying to head down, barrel through. And, and this is when we talked about earlier about the different hats. We hadn't quite realized, well, maybe we should take a different hat and take a softly, softly approach and not let's change everything straight mm. away. And I think uh, if you look around, um, there's tons of examples of uh, organizations that are sort of flagship organizations that are leading in digital world and things like that, that um, fail tons of times. You know, they've been undergoing these transformations, implementations of different frameworks and so on. They started with Scrum, then they decided that they are too large Scrum at scale. They're going to go to, then they decided that, oh, there's this safe thing that everybody is very jumping on the ship. Let's go safe direction. Let's go less direction. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. Is that, that that's just a natural sort of failure and realization that you need to move on to something else or adjust your things. So, um, I mean, it's okay to fail. This is what we, we, we keep saying. And it's okay to fail, not just in agile world. It's okay to fail in DevOps as well. The whole point of having a DevOps pipeline and the mindset is that when you fail, you catch it so quickly that you can reflect, respond and release fix real quick the whole point of containerization the whole point of all that ci cd and and things like that the infrastructure it's all the same concept you fail and it's okay to fail google has the entire organization dedicated the entire part of the organization dedicated to just failing and finding the way how to respond to that fail how the you know errors and things like that so um yeah thank you alexei thank you darren um I have just one worry, and uh, we have 13 minutes left, roughly, and I have so many questions. Um, it's unfortunate. I don't have a DevOps pipeline here to speed up my time to market with the questions and answers. Um, I, I'd like you to, to tackle the topic of, of learning and growth, right? So, Anthony, we, we met during learning, right? We've, we've both expressed oh, yes. our interest. You subscribed to your to a training of, of DevOps coaching, and we've probably both done before that the DevOps fundamentals by, by DASA. W was that it, right? So you, you check the box and you stop learning or, or what happened? Was it, how, how, have you, how do you do it to develop and grow as an agile coach? And, and what resources you found most valuable to recommend to our viewers? That's a really great question. Um, I actually, when I started off as a DevOps engineer, I started to, uh, I noticed that the more certifications that I got, especially the, the, the more sought after ones, the professional ones, I was getting higher pay. So I was like, oh, wait a second, I'm on to something. So then I started to, to look into more certifications and more certifications. And what I didn't realize is I tricked myself into continuous learning. So I was constantly learning all the time. I would be commuting and I would study. Uh, I would, you know, on the weekends, uh, my wife would let me work for half a day doing labs. And, you know, all this was just continuous learning. A so, crucial stakeholder. Right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, so over time, what I realized is that um, not only am I continuing to learn for myself. I'm also continuing to learn for my career. And I'm also able to take that learning, be able to share it with others. So I find that whenever I'm stagnant at work, or if I feel that I'm stagnant in life in general, I'll either order a book, pick it up, or I will take a course. I mean, Last year alone, I took 12 certification courses. Not because I wanted the certifications. I mean, sure, it was cherry on the cake. But for me, it was, it was about the learning. I wanted to learn more about the Agile domain. And so, therefore, I was like, well, if I'm in this, I'm all in. So, let's go. And I continuously do that all the time. And it not only brings me joy but it also inspires others 
when people see me take these certification courses, they're like, where do you find time? And it's like, well, where's your priorities? So if learning for you becomes a priority, then you're be, you will be able to be better at your job and you'll be able to share that knowledge with others so that they can be better at their job and also inspire a learning culture, which to me is so valuable because then it allows, you know, what we've been talking about, this culture of failure that we're, we're allowed to fail because we learn from it. And so, as you can see, this has been a journey for me. And this has probably been eight years in the, in the making. Uh, and, it, and it still continues today. What I can recommend for people to start with is, um, is a couple of great books. Uh, the DevOps Handbook, which is one of my faves. And, um, and of course, the, uh, uh, the Phoenix Project. Love Another, it. Yeah. Those are two great books that I always recommend to people who are either in DevOps, looking to get into DevOps, or even agile practitioners who want to understand how to do better DevOps. I think I'll just add to what, what Anthony just said oh, real quick, Marion. Um, there's a very interesting trend that I do find among um, agile and, and, and DevOps coaches is that majority of us are, I would position as a lifetime learners. So we constantly try to learn new techniques, new things and, and develop into different um, directions. And I think that also helps to, uh, I think that that kind of mindset helped to get into where we are. So I know that there was a question at some point of how to get into uh, coaching. I think being open to change, learning new things and um, progressing that direction. A lifetime learner. Thank you, Alexei. Darren, your favorite resource, your most valuable resource you would recommend to our participants? I mean, I, I think that there's a few. I mean, and, and Anthony mentioned sort of the, the 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 Phoenix project, and I think that was one of the things where that I read that I just really enjoyed. It was, you know, I read that over a weekend. It was, you know, interesting. It wasn't just these usual technical books about, you know, pipelines and stuff. It's a really interesting read. I think as well, um, doing something like the the Daza DevOps uh, coach training was useful it sort of opened my eyes to see ah, here's what i already know and here's some other things that can really help me expand on that from my side i'm a big believer in the the 70 20 10 approach so you know 10 percent of your learning and development is through trainings and certifications 20 percent, you know actually talking to people who've done this who have experience exchanging and getting a mentor and then the 70 percent is how you apply that learning experimenting go and do it um, for me, the best resource is just that experiment. Learn something, go into the wild, try it out, figure out if it works, figure does it fit your coaching style as well. Everyone has their own specific coaching style and then learn and develop from there. So for me, that's really important. No matter what resource you use, actually go and really use it. Don't just read a book and put it on your shelf and forget about it. Don't just do a certification and update your CV and, and think, oh, look at me with my all of these certifications. I'm so important. Now, what do you do with that? Use it, yeah. apply it, and as Anthony said, inspire others. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was going to say I, I really wanted to to highlight that is the 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 fact that you can take that knowledge and and apply it is so important, especially when you're talking about technical and you're talking about coaching. I mean, uh, I, I coach in the evenings because I want to keep up with my coaching skills, not just in, in, uh, in the workplace, but I want to be able to do it outside of the workplace. How do I constantly keep up? Because let's, let's be honest, we're not constantly coaching all the time. So how do we keep up with that skill set is we have to apply it. Um, and before we move on, I did want to point out something. Uh, somebody said in the comments, uh, Luigi, and he was talking about instead of failing, why aren't we talking about experimenting? And I think that was a really great call out. And I appreciate sure. that, Luigi. 
Um, we shouldn't be talking about a culture of failure, but we should be talking about a culture of experimentation. And so I, I really wanted to, uh, to bring that to light. So thank you, Luigi. Thank you, Anthony. Um, let's, let's pick up one question from the audience um, around learning. According to the Scrum framework, there are two roles such as Agile team leader and Scrum master. Can you elaborate and clarify how does a DevOps coach maps dimension roles? Um, I would say that it really, really helps um, to um, educate yourself on a Scrum master and Agile leader role don't uh, don't recommend any specific training as, as long as it's good enough for your purpose um, before kicking it off as as a DevOps slash agile coach. Um, being a DevOps coach builds up on these roles. It, it would really help you um, to what you, Darren and Anthony call, have skin in the game by being beforehand and a scrum master. And especially if you had a chance to um, lead a project slash team in an agile way. What, what's the, what, are, what's, what are the difference? Um, the DevOps coaching training brings in new aspects, right? So um, the very structured columns approach, so culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing. Um, it, it binds Scrum, lean, um, um, cloud infrastructure, automation, metrics all together in a, in a very um, pragmatic and um, goal-oriented way, right? So that's uh, that's what what was there for me in the DevOps coaching training, and then of course what you Darren said, the different hats, right? So learn to change the hats, learn to change the roles, um, given the environment and given the maturity of, of the teams. Um, Maybe one of the last questions, and I really like that this one, who pays the party, right? So how do we deal with the high financial cost component that comes with DevOps and Agile adoption? In the end, um, we are not uh, working for charitable organizations, right? So who would like to pick that one? Maybe I can start. Um, because I was challenged with that multiple times. Um, for me, the key was to, to link, it with, link it with business objectives and prove in, in a measurable way that DevOps and Agile are going to improve the business metrics. So the business objectives. Um, there, is, uh, there are a few studies um, that are freely accessible by a partner organization of DASA, the DORA, DORA. Um, the business case of DevOps transformation, um, quite a good approach to start with. So uh, have a look at it um, to build up your financial business case on that. And um, that's also a topic in the DevOps coaching training. So um, I think it comes towards the end once you've learned the basics. Well, uh, how do you actually justify um, your coaching assignments in terms of financial in, uh, impact? All right. Anything to add on that, gentlemen? Not really. I think uh, the one thing that uh, always is important from my perspective is whatever the, the cost is, we should be reducing that cost long term. If we don't implement Agile and DevOps, we're probably losing money somewhere else. And ideally, as a coach, when we're going in, we're looking to spread that knowledge and build those resources. So, you know, it's not just money out, it's we're building the knowledge internally as well. Thank you, Varen. Um, I'm really enjoying this talk, um, but I suppose I have to, to wrap it up, guys. Um, there are a few unanswered questions. Um, maybe we can tackle them um, in a carve out sessions or, or maybe posts in the, in the DASA community. Um, on LinkedIn. I remind you of the survey to share your feedback. We truly believe in, in continuous improvement here. Um, our next topic um, in June will be scaling DevOps, coaching strategies for large and complex organizations. You're welcome to join. And of course, my most sincere thanks uh, to you, Alexei, Anthony, Darren. That was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Um, truly, truly appreciate it. 
Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks Thank for you, having Marianne. us. Thank and you, Marion. And thanks everyone for the questions. Take care, guys. Have a nice afternoon. Have a nice day, a nice evening. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Cheers. Thanks.